I'm thrilled to have one of my favorite clients and also one of my favorite people on the podcast today, Strider G. Dennison. Um, he is a sales leader with tons of experience from startup to large organization, which is why I wanted him to be on this podcast because most of our listeners are um, either from tech startups or at different levels in their entrepreneurial journey. And I think that Strider has some great insight for you guys about um, how to lead, successfully lead a sales organization at different phases of business. So Strider, if you don't mind, just introduce yourself, talk a little bit about what you're doing now and how you got there. And then I have um, a lot of questions I want to dig into. So sure, let's go. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Um, as you said, my name is Strider Dennison. You know, I, uh, I'm a native of Cheney, Washington, outside of Spokane, and I think it's relevant to kind of know geography, and it's relevant to know where people come from, not just from a leadership perspective, but even when you're hiring salespeople. So that's why I start with kind of who you are by by where you've come from. I'm married, uh, three kids, and uh, and having a blast with that. I've been in the industry for 23 years, uh, 20 of it in leadership, and I've led teams across the Pacific Northwest, the Southwest, the Northeast, and the Southeast. Um, so the only part of the country I haven't effectively sold in is right in the middle. Um, but I have you could probably do a podcast. You could probably do a podcast on on how to lead a sales organization in each different region of the country because I'm sure it's different. Absolutely. <laughs> and and there and you nailed it. There are similarities and then there are vast differences. And that's why I started with geography because I do think it's important to know kind of how people are. So yeah, I've worked for companies as small as startups with you know uh, 15, 20 people, as large as you know Fortune 50 companies you know, that are publicly traded. So a vast, um, you know, experience across the gamut. Yeah. And today you're at LS Networks. Today uh, I'm at LS Networks. Yep. So I'm the, VP of LS Networks. Yeah. I'm the VP of sales and marketing at LS Networks. And, you know, really we're a fiber optic provider in the Pacific Northwest focused on providing fiber and high capacity internet to businesses in underserviced areas, which means either there's no, uh, level of competition and kind of a monopoly or the the providers that are there just simply don't have the capacity uh, within their own networks to provide high capacity fiber optic internet. And as you know, businesses today rely on the internet as their lifeblood, um, regardless of what size of organization you are and regardless where you're located, you know, the internet is part of your, your heartbeat of every company. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And I've really, it's been a joy working with you guys so far because I can truly feel, and I'm not just saying this, but really feel um, the passion of your team uh, that that your team has in doing something that's, you know, I mean, really can be a tremendous gift and blessing to a lot of businesses. I know if my internet's out for one Zoom call, I'm, you know, <laughs> throwing hands and throwing stuff off the table. And I know that um, businesses like mine and um, a lot of others in the country rely on the stability of good internet to be able to do our job. So it's very important what you're doing. So can we talk about um, the difference? So I always like to talk about things at three different phases. And this is just because I, I firmly believe in um, that marketing strategy looks different for a startup than it does for a Fortune 50 company. So uh, no grow and scale at different sizes, and it sounds like you've been a part of, and led sales organizations at different phases, but can you talk a little bit about what a sales organization might look like for a startup versus what a sales organization might look like for a much larger corporation and how you as a sales leader have evolved or changed things for those teams that you have been leading? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think, you know, the organizations have both their pluses and minuses. You know, I think um, based on your personal preference and just kind of where you are in your own career, so they can both be um, blessings and they can both have their own, you know, curses as well. For larger companies, you know, really, they typically have, uh, and we're, we wouldn't even say larger, I'll just say established companies, because I think that there's right. probably a phase in between, you know, Fortune 50 as well as just established company. And those those companies are gonna have similarities. You know, they're gonna have processes pretty well baked. Um, they're gonna kind of have you know how the uh, organization operates from A to Z through different departments, departmental communication. So a lot of those things are typically pretty well, um, uh, at least on paper, they're they're well written out. 
Uh, they typically have bigger budgets or more established budget budgets around the, their spend. They know where they're going as far as you know historical data and where they you know where they're spending their money to drive revenue or to drive efficiencies. The challenge is, is you know, the larger the organization, or more established the organization, they can have more layers of leadership. Right. They can also have um, challenges with, you know, the distance between the decision process, meaning that the field or individual contributor, regardless of the department, has to go through layers of communication to get to a decision, whereas on the right. car versus smaller company would be opposite. Right. And I think, you know, again, like you said, having a structured team can be really good, but also having, you know, the ability to be nimble <laughs> is nice too. So I think that for a sales team member, I know that would probably would present um, some pluses and minuses. So where do you start? You've built a lot of sales teams and grown a lot of sales teams. Where do you start building a team? Like if it, you know, specifically for the CEO of a company who may have reached, you know, that, milestone of maybe like 15 employees or 20 employees and now the ceo or the the founder is going from starting the business and selling it themselves to maybe right. starting to hire somebody to do that like where do you start and what do you look for when you're building a team you know that's uh, i think there's a lot of variables here i think specifically in the sales side you want a good leader and i think it all starts with the leadership you know people follow people uh, my style is more of a servant leader style. You know, I'd rather lead from the front of my organization, but keeping in mind where all of the steps that each one of my members are taking prior to them taking it, making sure that it's they are going in the right path. You know, yeah. I, I always tell people, you know, you, you need to know the skill sets, the tasks, the duties of that role, regardless of what part of the business is in, but specifically sales. If it's a transactional sale versus a very um, uh, long sales process, which is more RFP driven or more, more strategic driven, you need to make sure you're matching those skills. Don't match them to people. You know, often we'll say in life, hey, oh gosh, Mary was such a great salesperson. We want to find another Mary. Well, there's only one Mary. And I think right. that we get caught up in that. We really need to focus on the, on the, on the people. Um, I also, I, I think that, you know, in, in the, you know, you want to develop um, a recruiting process, uh, an interviewing process, use a sales assessment. I, I highly encourage it based on your um, your sales organization. If it's high, high uh, transaction or more strategic, have that kind of sales assessment. Onboarding, no matter how big or small the company is, I've noticed that that's a challenge. Fortune 50 companies are no better at onboarding than startup companies at times. So I would say that if you really want a good, a good lesson, you know, welcome the people to your organization with a really strong onboarding. And that's not you know, lunches and catered events. It's really about what is their path? What does their day look like? What's their agenda? Help them get through that initial learning curve and a lot of that paperwork. Um, yeah. The training, you know, training, I think people kind of get lost in that. And listen, I get it. Uh, we're lifelong learners. We got to train all the time. But I think if you give them a crash course of their comfort level is up and then you follow up with, you know, coaching and mentorship and, and, you know, at the end of the day, go produce, go sell. Yeah. I like that. What do you have a preference on what your what assessment you use? Do you have one that you or is your go to? Um, our company, sales? our company, actually, you know, a lot of them are out there. Some of them are fairly inexpensive. You could use ones that are from yeah. Indeed. Um, you can yeah. get three versions. Uh, the one that we use is a company called Harver, H-A-V-E-R. And mm -hmm. that's the sales assessment tool that we're using. It, we use it through Hiring Thing, which is a platform that allows us to do that. And we do that for most of the positions we have, not just sales. Okay. I, I did an interview on this same podcast with Stephen Johnston, who's the CEO of Good Job. I don't know if we've talked about him before, but you said you're a servant leader, and that's actually one of their profiles. So okay. it's kind of interesting that you said that. They um, they are a, more of a personality-based, kind of like a tender for um mm -hmm for recruiting, but it's a, it's a cool tool as well. So just shout out to him because he's awesome. Absolutely. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll piggyback off that. And I'll say that people underestimate those assessments. They are very scientific. I'm not saying that you hire or not hire somebody solely on that assessment, but that assessment will allow you to ask questions specific right. to that individual and how it applies to that job. Then you can determine if they're the right person. Well, and in my experience, I have learned, and this is kind of the model that, that that they take at Good Job, and I think some of these others is, you know, a resume is nice, but that doesn't tell you. I mean, it can tell you where they work, but it doesn't tell you about the personality of the person and what drives them, what motivates them, 
which is 100%, especially in sales, that's the information you need to know. You know, a resume is good to have, but it's also not a, a determining factor of whether or not they're going to be good in that position or not. So. Yeah. Um, okay. This is a trick question because I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this, but I'm curious. So um, I'm interested because I've had a lot of these conversations with other companies that I work with about how long you feel like it takes to know if a salesperson is in the right seat or not. Um, is there a formula for that or is there not? Because somebody, I was talking about this to somebody this morning and I'm like, well, what is the magic number in sales to know if it's uh, going to work or not? Just well, first thing I would say is hire slow and fire fast. And I would say through your interviewing questions, really make sure you have open ended uh, objective around the job type questions with scenario kind of based questions. So you really make paint the picture and make them kind of tell you from that lens. And the reason I say hire slow and fire fast, right? We got to find the right people. It's a huge investment to your organization, time, money, energy, and morale within the own team. You know, if nobody yeah. likes to see a revolving door and the, and the whole fire fast thing is, is, listen, that's the hardest thing that any leader has to go through. I always measure people on attitude and aptitude. Do they have the right attitude to win? Do they have the aptitude to do this job? And then I will invest in them. Once they kind of break those rules of attitude and aptitude, I, I, I kind of move quickly to separation because it's really for them. You know, it's as goofy as it sounds as a servant leader. I don't want them to go through their life talking to their family stressed out, not enjoying right. their work, bringing the rest of the team down. I'd rather part ways as friends, help them if, right. they're, if, they're, if they're amenable to it, to getting the next career because it's part of part of their journey as well as it is our journey to not put them in that's that tough situation. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And I think as a leader too, you have to know that, that it's not, it's not just for your sake, but it is for them. That's good. Um, okay. Well, you handled that trick question very well. So thank you. Um, okay. So how do you, how, what is a good, and I'm, I'm trying to figure this out for myself because as my, my team grows, I'm looking at, I've already identified who I believe is my next salesperson, um, but she doesn't know it yet. Um, <laughs> but I, I am interested to know, like, what's a good cadence for, you know, you don't want to over meet and meet just to meet. And I feel like there's a lot of that in the corporate world, you know, just meeting to have meetings. So what is a good cadence um, for a sales leader from a meeting standpoint? And that's a pretty practical question, but it's just out of curiosity. A couple of things, be consistent, you know, have your one-on-ones, have your team meetings, your coaching or training sessions, whatever they are, be consistent. If it's on Tuesday at two o'clock, then keep them Tuesday at two o'clock. People's lives try to revolve around their calendars. Uh, I said two o'clock and I probably kick myself under the table, you know, stay outside the money hours as much as possible. Um, right. You know, especially with salespeople, if you can, if you can have those meetings earlier or later, the better. That's cool. uh, yeah. I, I always try to tell people, keep them to 45 minutes. And I, and I use 45 minutes because 30 is not long enough and an hour is just too long. But you typically get booked on top of each other. So if you book it for 45 right. minutes, you kind of can buy yourself a 15 minute uh, in between to either mentally prepare or if the meeting does run long, you're not putting somebody else's meeting at jeopardy. Right. And um, I also encourage people, especially in sales, have 10 minute standups. You're not even sitting down. It's a real quick, hey, what's your plan for the day? What do we got going on? What's your forecast for the day, the activity, the objective, and then get in and get out. Um, yeah. And if they are more formal meetings, have an agenda. Probably yeah. my biggest pet peeve is showing up to a meeting that's an hour long with no agenda, not knowing what are we talking about, how to prepare, and you know, does it really warrant an hour? So be consistent, have an agenda, use 45 minute increments and have quick short meetings when possible. That's good. That's good. I like that. Okay. So the, the big one, and I'm having thunder here in the South, summer, I love it. Per a perfect summer, uh, Southern day. Um, how do you, and this is good for anybody, not just in sales, but I would say sales is probably the hardest to keep people motivated. Um, so what, and I know there's no secret formula, but you've been doing it long enough. So you've got to, you've got to know some tips, but what are some ways to keep people incentivized, keep them motivated, keep them excited about what they're doing? Cause you've had some, you've got some folks on your team that have been there a really long time. Um, yeah. so that's a good, you know, good thing to see. So what are, what are those, uh, secret tips you have for us? You know, uh, I think a lot of people put too much weight into trying to figure this out. It's simple. In my opinion, know your people, 
ask them what motivates you and i know that sounds goofy but you know that each individual is motivated by something specific and personal to them so the more you know through your leaders or directly with your your frontline um salespeople, what motivates them that those things matter um yeah. I, I i tell people let's have fun we, we we're at work um you know eight nine ten hours a day this is a consumes a big part of our lives if you're not enjoying it then you're not then that should you shouldn't be here so first have fun and then have a reward system that is in my mind especially for sales you want to reward behaviors on the leading indicators with contests and spiffs right they're usually lower dollar value i don't like to give away money at all i'd rather give out a prize something that is mm -hmm. tangible maybe even mm -hmm. something that's related to their family um, and then I like those to be more cons more regular, right? Faster, smaller amounts, but very, very consistent, especially with a high activity team. You want to be kind of high fiving them a lot. And then you celebrate the lagging indicators. What I mean by that is president's club or quarterly clubs or monthly prizes, monthly clubs. Those are a little bit bigger, a little bit more exposure. Well, those are the ones that I think people strive for. So you get the behaviors that drive through the incentives, but then you get that really recognition, that celebration through that, through their performance. Another tip that I would recommend to all leaders is do a skip level. And a skip level is you take uh, a few minutes to meet with your sales leaders team. And it's not a, it's, there's no shade on them. You, you do it up front. You let your leader know, hey, I'm doing a skip level. Uh, we're gonna do a little 360 on you. Uh, here's some of the questions I'm gonna ask. Here's some of the things that we're gonna talk through, but I'm gonna meet with your team for an hour on this date and you put it on the calendar. And you listen to the feedback, you listen to what people have to say. Sometimes it allows them just to have a few minutes to vent but then you can have them also help you coach their leader with a stop, start, continue. What does your leader need to stop doing? What does your leader need to start doing? And what should your leader continue to do more of? And then I would say if you're um, like me, I ask the same question about myself. You know, what coaching or advice do you have for me as your leader's leader um, when you're in that front line? And I think also be seen. Oh, man, nothing makes me more bummed out than a sales leader or any leader in general that is in their office. The door is closed. The blinds are closed. They're conference calling it all day. Get out. Walk around. See the people. STP. See the people. Get in the market. Go out and cold call. Go on an appointment. You don't have to do it every week, every day. But go out and do that, and you'll build a ton of brand for yourself and the, yeah. the salespeople love it. That's a huge morale builder, I think. If if people are out there grinding every day, they want to not feel alone. I know. So that's our awesome. team just recently uh, hired a, a sales a sales training company, and uh, we're going around the horn, and people are doing you know role plays and stuff. And I said, okay, my turn. And everybody was like shocked that I participated. I got involved. Oh, I role played. I fell flat on my face a few times. I got some coaching, you know, from my sales team. In fact, and they loved it. We were able to have a really dynamic conversation. And I show them I'm, I'm humble. I'm a human too. Yeah. And, and I think yeah. it, it went a long ways with them. I think the day that you, you know, stop thinking or understanding that you can learn from anybody is, is the day that you need to hang it up. You know, I feel yep. like we can, we can all learn from everybody around us, no matter their position or title. I've never been, you know, big on titles. I know the corporate world needs them to be able to identify folks, but I think that, you know, we, we all learn from each other regardless. So I think that's, that's cool. Okay, so here's what I've learned from you. Be, uh, hire, be seen. I think that was the number one. I think being visible yeah. to your team. Um, hire slow, fire fast. Love that. I wrote these things down. These are like my, my own notes. Um, looking for attitude and aptitude in your teams. Um, and then staying outside the the money hours. You know, for I, honestly, I had not really thought of that. I know lots of people that have sales teams that meet during the money hours. So I think that's a good learning from this. Um and then uh, the skip level meetings. I think I'll take that, you know, as as I grow and as I meet with other um, uh, organizations. I think that's a good good thought. I've, I've heard of like a 360 when like in writing, uh, maybe doing like a peer evaluation or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I've never heard of it just like having a, a you know meeting with those people and really talking, which I think I'm sure will be really beneficial. So, um, okay, awesome. Okay, I want to know because I know you're a big reader. And also, I'm going to give you a plug because you're one of the few leaders that also lets his team know about his personal goals so that your team can keep you accountable to what you have uh, set to achieve personally, which I think is awesome. I think that's really good. You know, a lot of times we want to hide behind our personal goals just in case we, right. we don't meet them so that we don't get uh, don't get any flack from people. So I think that's awesome. Um, and I know you're a big reader. So you just sent me a book that I have right here in my lap. I want to know what you're reading. This might be one of them. But um, 
So what are you reading right now? Maybe give me like your top two or three favorite um, books that you would recommend to a sales leader entrepreneur. I know it's a big question. Gosh, um, I'm one of those kind of people that always has to have the book in front of me. Uh, I would okay. say Radical Cantor. If you ever read that book, that's oh, one that yes. you need to that read. Kim, Kim something. What's her name? Yeah, I, it's sitting on my bookshelf, so I'll have to grab it. But yeah, Radical Cantor. Kim Scott. Kim Scott. Yeah, Kim Scott. Yeah. And then um, uh, Choose Possibilities is a really great career book. Um, okay. From a sales perspective, strategies perspective, we're doing Sandler. And I think Sandler's 49 Principles is just an unbelievable book. I think Sandler scales to transactional all the way up to enterprise level. The other training I really like are strategic training by Miller Hyman. So if you're looking for training and tactical process driven books and then, yeah, we're, uh, we're doing the conversion code because I'm kind of teaching people modern day sales is, is a combination of old school door knocking and lead gen and partnering with your marketing teams to help um, drive more opportunities, awareness, and to help open more doors um, that are just been closed due to various reasons. So uh, I, lend, I also listen to a ton of podcasts and on a personal one, I'm listening to uh, Stranger in a Strange Land. It's a it's a book on Audible that my mother recommended to me, and it's actually a 1960s sci-fi. So if you're looking for just a little bit of brevity from all of those serious things, it's one that will definitely kind of make you shake your head and laugh a little bit. I'm, I'm headed to the beach next week, but I don't think sci-fi is going to make my list. So I've got to go. I do make myself read a non-work related book at the beach. So I'm, I've got to figure out what I'm taking with me. But yeah. I think you have to have um, a break. I try to read two yeah. kind of work. You know, I try to read a tactical book, a strategic book, and then a personal book and those kind of those order. I don't always go back to back like that, but but I try to kind of mix that because I also think it makes your brain think differently, tie them together in yeah. a unique way. Yeah. That does. That's awesome. Well, this has been great. I know a breath of fresh air for me. Um, I think it will be really helpful for many. We'll probably have to get you back on and talk about maybe sales in the South, sales in the Northeast, right. sales in the Pacific Northwest. I, I know I've actually shared this book with a, another um, colleague of mine that I think will benefit from it greatly. And I know if it comes from you, it's a good recommendation. So I appreciate your time today. Can you tell us, um, I know the answer, um, but Let's just see. I know you know it too, but where somebody would find LS Networks if they're interested in learning more about the company? Well, that's a great question. You can find us at the W's, www.lsnetworks.net. And we've got a that's new right. website coming down the line and I'm super pumped for yeah. it to be rolled out. You can also find us on yeah. social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Um, come and find us, Graham. follow us, engage. We'd love to have you. Awesome. Thank you, Strider. Thank you so much.